Chapters five and six of And Then the Town Took Off by Richard Wilson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter five. There were clouds below that occasionally hid the earth from sight. For a minute or more they gazed in silence at the magnificent view. This wasn't built in a day, Jen Jervis said at last. I should say not, Don agreed. Millions of years. She looked at him sharply. I wasn't talking about the age of the earth. I mean this room, this lookout post, whatever it is. He grinned at her. I agree with you there, too. I'm really a very agreeable fellow, Miss Jervis. Obviously whoever built it knew well in advance that Superior was going to take off. They also knew how much of it was going up and exactly where this would have to be built so it would be at the edge. Under the edge, you mean, with a downward view. That's right. From a distance, I'd say Superior looked as if someone had cut off the end of an orange. The flat part where the cut was made is the surface, and we're looking out from a piece of the convex skin. You put things so simply, Mr. Court, that even a child could understand, she said acidly. Thank you, he said complacently. He had remembered that whoever was listening in for military intelligence through the tiny radio under his shirt could have only a vague idea of what was going on. Any little word pictures he could supply, therefore, would help them understand. He had to risk the fact that his companion might think him a bit of an idiot. Of course, with this Geneva Jervis, it was easy to lay himself open to the scathing comment and the barbed retort. He imagined she was extremely useful in a role as Girl Friday to Senator Bobby Thebold. "'I don't think this is the word of those boobies at the booby hatch,' she was saying. "'I beg your pardon?' "'The Cavalier Institute of Applied Foolishness, whatever they call it. They just wouldn't be capable of an undertaking of this scope.' "'Oh, I agree. That's why I let you drag me away from the meeting. It was a lot of pseudo-scientific malarkey. Old Doc Ruback, DVM, was going on about the ultimote being connected to the thigh bone, way up in the middle of the air. Tell me, who do you think is behind it all? She was walking around the big sided room as if taking mental inventory. There wasn't much to catalogue. Six straight chairs, heavy and modern looking, with a large wooden table, a framed piece of dark glass that might be a television set, and a gray steel box about the size and shape of a three-drawer filing cabinet. This last was near the big window wall, and had three black buttons on its otherwise smooth top. Don itched to push the buttons to see what would happen. Jen Jervis seemed to have the same urge. She drummed on the box with her long fingernails. I, she said, behind it all? Yes, what's your theory? Is this something for the Unearthly Activities Committee to investigate? Don't be impertinent. If the senator thinks it's his duty to look into it, he will. He undoubtedly is already. In the meantime, I can do no less than gather whatever information I can while I'm on the scene. Very patriotic. What do you conclude from your information gathering so far? Obviously there's some kind of conspiracy, she began then stopped as if she suspected a trap. A foot, Don said with a grin. As I see it, all you do is have Bobby the Bold subpoena everybody up here, every last man jack of them, to testify before his committee. They wouldn't dare refuse. I don't find you a bit amusing, Mr. Court, though I have no doubt this sophomoric humor makes a big hit with your teenage blonde. We'd better get back. I can see it was a mistake to expect any cooperation from you as you like, Madame Investigator. Don gave her a mock bow, then turned for a last look down at the vast segment of earth below. Gina Jervis screamed. He whirled to see her standing big-eyed and open-mouthed in front of the framed dark glass he had taken for a television screen. Her face was contorted in horror, and as Don's gaze flicked to the screen, he had the barest glimpse of a pair of eyes fading with a dissolving image. Then the screen was blank, and Don wasn't sure whether there had been a face to go with the eyes, an inhuman, unearthly face, or whether his imagination had supplied it. 
the girl slumped to the floor in a faint. Columbus, Ohio, November 1, Associated Press. Senator Robert Bobby Thebold landed here today after leading his private pilot's PP squadron of P-38s on a reconnaissance flight which resulted in the loss of one of the six World War II fighters in a crash landing on the mysteriously airborne town of Superior, Ohio. The pilot of the crash plane parachuted safely to earth. Senator Thebold told reporters grimly, There is no doubt in my mind that mysterious forces are at work when a town of three thousand population can rise in a body off the face of the earth. My reconnaissance has shown conclusively that the town is intact and its inhabitants alive. On one of my passes I saw my secretary, Miss Geneva Jervis. Senator Thebold said he was confident Miss Jervis would contact him the moment she had anything to report, indicating she would make an on-the-spot investigation. The senator said in reply to a question that he was amazed at official Washington's complete inaction in the matter, and declared he would demand a probe by the Senate Investigation Subcommittee, of which he is a member. He indicated witnesses might include officials of the Defense Department, the Central Intelligence Agency, and possibly others. Landenburg, Ohio, November 1, United Press International. Little Ladenburg, former neighbor of the city in the sky, complained today of a rain of empty beer cans and other rubbish apparently being tossed over the edge by residents of Airborne Superior. They're not so high and mighty, one sanitation official here said, that they can make Ladenburg their garbage dump. Washington, November 1st. Reuters. American officials today were at a loss to explain the strange behavior of Superior, Ohio, the town that took off. Authoritative sources assured Reuters that no military or scientific experiments were in progress which could account for the phenomenon of a town being lifted intact thousands of feet into the air. Rumors circulating to the effect that a communist plot was at work were greeted with extreme skepticism in official quarters. Bulletin, Columbus, Ohio, November 1, United Press International the airborne town of Superior began to drift east across Ohio late today. Chapter 6 The unconscious Geneva Jervis, lying crumpled up in the oversized fur coat, was the immediate problem. Don Court straightened her out so she lay on her back, took off her shoes and propped her ankles on the lower rung of a chair. He found she was wearing a belt and loosened it. It was obvious that she was also wearing a girdle but there wasn't anything he wanted to do about that. He was rubbing one of her wrists when her eyes fluttered open. She smiled self-consciously. I guess I was a sissy. Not at all. I saw it, too, a pair of eyes. And a face, a horrible, horrible face. I wasn't sure about the face. Can you describe it? She darted a tentative look at the screen, but it was comfortingly blank. It wasn't human and it was staring right into me. It was awful. Did it have a nose, ears, mouth? I... I can't be sure. Let's get out of here. I'm all right now. Thanks for being so good to me, Don. Don't mention it, Jen. Here, put your shoes on. When he had closed the big wooden door behind them, Don padlocked it again. He preferred to leave things as they'd found them, even though their visit to the observation room was no longer a secret. He was relieved when they had scrambled up the steps under the grandstand. There had been no sense of any one or anything following them or spying on them during their long walk through the tunnel. They were silent with their separate thoughts as they crossed the frosty ground, and Jen held Don's arm, more for companionship than support. At the campus the girl excused herself, saying she still felt shaky and wanted to rest in her room. Don went back to the dining room. The meeting was over, but Alice Garrett was there, having a cup of tea and reading a book. "'Well, sir,' she said, giving him an intent look, "'how was the rendezvous?' "'Fair to middling.' He was relieved to see that she wasn't angry. "'Did anybody say anything while I was gone?' "'Not a coherent word. You don't deserve it, but I made notes for you. Running off with that redhead when you have a perfectly adequate blonde. Did you kiss her?' 
"'Of course not. It was strictly business. Let me see the notes, you angel.' "'Notes, then.' She handed over a wad of paper. "'Rubat,' he read. "'Magnology, stuff, 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 etc., etc. Nothing. Question, Conductor James Brown. What about Mayor's proclamation, Superior, succeeded, from Earth? Answer, Civic. Repeated stuff about discrimination against Superior and Cavalier and bubblegum prices. Question, what do you expect gain? Answer, stuff about end discrimination. Question, sovereignty? Answer, how's that? Question, are you trying to set up Superior as a separate city-state with government independent of U.S. or Earth? That conductor ground is sharper than I gave him credit for, Alice elaborated. Answer, hem and haw. Well, now. Question, well, are you? Answer, father rescuing civic. Question of sovereignty must remain temporarily up in the air. Laughter, fathers. When and if superior returns, will accept state federal laws as before, but meantime certs warrant adapt to prevailing conditions. Rest of meeting was about sleeping arrangements, meals, recreation privileges, clothing, etc. Don folded the notes and put them in his pocket. Thanks, I see I didn't miss much. The only thing it seems to add is that Mayor Civic is a figurehead, and that if Cavalier people know anything, they're not talking except in gobbledygook. Check, Alice said. Now, let's go take a look at Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh? That's where we are now. One of the students who lives there peeked over the edge a while ago. I was waiting for you to come back before I went to have a look. Pittsburgh? Don repeated. You mean superiors drifting across the United States? Either that or it's being pushed. Let's go see. There hadn't been much to see, and it had been too cold to watch for long. The lights of Pittsburgh were beginning to go on in the dusk, and the city looked pretty and far away. A Pennsylvania Air National Guard plane came up to investigate, but from a respectful distance. Then it flew off. Don left Alice shivering at her door and decided he wanted a drink. He remembered having seen a sign Club Lyric down the street from the sentry office, and he headed for it. Sergeant Court, said a muffled voice under his collar. Don jumped. He'd forgotten for the moment that he was a walking radio station. Yes, he said. Reception has been excellent, the voice said. It was no longer that of Captain Simmons. You needn't recapitulate. We've heard all your conversations and feel we know as much as you do. You'll have to admit it isn't much. I'm afraid not. What do you want me to do now? Should I go back and investigate that underground room again? That seems to be the best lead so far. No, you're just a bank messenger whose biggest concern was to safeguard the contents of the briefcase. Now that the contents are presumably in the bank vault, your official worries are over. And though you're curious to know why Superior's acting the way it is, you're willing to let somebody else do something about it. But they saw me in the room. Those eyes, whatever they are, I had the feeling, well, that they weren't human. Nonsense, the voice from the Pentagon said. An ordinary closed-circuit television hookup. Don't let your imagination run away with you. And above all, don't play spy. If they're suspicious of anyone, it will be of Geneva Jervis, because of her connection with Senator Thebold. Where are you going now? Well, sir, I thought, that is, if there's no objection, I thought I'd go have a drink, see what the townspeople are saying. Good idea. Do that. What are they saying in Washington? Does anybody put any stock in this magnology stuff of Professor Garrett's? Facts are being collated. There's been no evaluation yet. You'll hear from us again when there's something to tell you. For now, Court, carry on. You're doing a splendid job. The streets were cold, dark, and deserted. The few street lights were feeble, and the lights in the houses and other buildings seemed dimmer than normal. A biting wind had sprung up, and Don was glad when he saw the neon words, Club Lyric, ahead. The bartender greeted him cheerfully. It ain't a fit night. What'll it be? Don decided on a straight shot to start. What's going on? he asked. Where's the old town going? The bartender shrugged. Let Civic worry about that. It's what we pay him for, ain't it? I suppose so. 
How are you fixed for liquor? Big supply? Last a couple of weeks unless people start drinking more than usual. Beer will run out first. That's right, I guess. But aren't you worried about being up in the air like this? The bartender shrugged again. Not much I can do about it, is there? Want another shot? Mix it this time, a little soda. Is that the general attitude? Business as usual? I hear some business is picking up. Lots of people buying winter clothes for one thing, weather turning cold the way it did. And Dabney Brothers, they run the coal and fuel oil company, got enough orders to keep them going night and day for a week. That's fine, but when they eventually run out like you, then what? Everybody freeze to death? The bartender made a thoughtful face. You got something there. Oh, hello, Ed. Kind of brisk tonight. It was Ed Clark, the newspaper man. Clark noted to the bartender, who began to mix him a martini. Freeze the ears off a brass monkey, Clark said, joining Don. I have an extra pair of earmuffs if you'd like them. Thanks, Don said, but I think I'd better buy myself some winter clothes tomorrow and return yours. Suit yourself planning to settle down here? I don't seem to have much choice. Anything new at your end? Clark lifted his brimming glass and took a sip. Here's to a mild winter. New? I guess you know we're in Pennsylvania now and not Ohio. Over Pennsylvania, I should say. Don't ask me why, unless Hector Civic thinks Superior will get a better break, tax-wise. You think the mayor's behind it all? He has delusions of grandeur like a lot of people here but I do think Hector knows more than he's telling. Some of the merchants, mostly those whose business hasn't benefited by the cold wave, have called a meeting for tomorrow. They want to pump him. He wasn't exactly a flowing spout at Cavalier this afternoon when the people from the train wanted answers. So that's where he was. They couldn't find him at Town Hall. Where's it all going to end? If we keep on drifting, we'll be over the Atlantic, next stop Europe. Then Superior will be crossing national boundaries instead of just state lines, and some country may decide we're violating its airspace and shoot us out of the sky. I see you take the long view, Clark said. Is there any other? Don asked. The alternative is to kid ourselves that everything's all right and trust in Providence and Hector Civic. What is it with you people? You don't seem to realize that sixteen square miles of solid earth and three thousand people have taken off to go waltzing through the sky. That isn't just something that happens. Something or somebody's making it happen. The question is, who or what, and what are you going to do about it? The bartender said, The boy's right, Ed. How do we know they won't take us up higher? Up where there's no air, then we'd be cooked. Clark laughed. Cooked is hardly the word, but I agree that things are getting out of hand. He set down his glass with a clink. I know the man we want. Old Doc Fendi. He could stir things up. Remember the time they tried to run the pipeline through town and Doc formed a citizens' committee and stopped them? Stopped them dead, the bartender recalled, then cleared his throat. Speak of the devil. He raised his voice and greeted the man who had just walked in. Well, Doc, long time since we've had the pleasure of your company. Nice to see you. Doc Fendi was an imposing old gentleman of more than average height and magnificent girth. He carried a paunch with authority. His hands at the ends of short arms seemed to fall naturally to it, and he patted the pouch with satisfaction as he spoke. He was dressed for the cold weather in an old frock coat, black turning green, with a double line of oversized buttons down the front and huge eighteenth-century lapels. He wore a battered black slouch hat which long ago had given up the pretense of holding any particular shape. "'Salutations, gentlemen,' Doc Fendi boomed, striding majestically toward the bar. "'They tell me our peripatetic little town has just passed Pittsburgh. I'd have thought it more likely we'd cross the Arctic Circle. Rum, bartender, is the only suitable potable for the occasion.' Clark introduced Don, who saw that close up, Doc Bendy's face was full and firm rather than fat. The nose had begun to develop the network of visible blood vessels which indicated a fondness for the bottle. Shaggy white eyebrows matched the fringe of white hair that sprouted from under the sides and back of the slouch hat. The eyes themselves were alert and humorous. 
The mouth rose subtly at the corners and, though Bendy never seemed to smile outright, it conveyed the same humor as the eyes. These two features, in fact, saved the old man from seeming pompous. Don noticed that the rum the bartender poured for Bendy was 151 proof, and the portion was a generous one. Bendy raised his glass. "'Your health, gentlemen.' He took a sip and put it down. "'I might also drink to a happy voyage, destination unknown. Don here thinks we're in danger of drifting over Europe.' "'A distinct possibility,' Bendy said. "'Your passports are in order, I trust. I remember the first time I went to the continent. It was with Blackjack Pershing and the AEF. Were you in the medical corps, sir?' Don asked. Doc Bendy boomed with laughter, holding his paunch. "'Bless your soul, lad, I'm no doctor. I was on the board of directors of Superior's first hospital, hence the title. A mere courtesy conferred on me by a grateful citizenry.' "'The citizens might be looking to you again, Doc,' Clark said, since their elected representatives are letting them down. "'But not bringing them down, eh? Suppose you tell me what you know, Mr. Editor. I assume you're the best informed man on the situation.' barring the conspirators who have dragged us aloft. You think it's a conspiracy? It's not an act of God. Clark began to fill an ancient pipe, so well caked that the pencil with which he tamped the tobacco barely fitted into the bowl. By the time when the pipe was ready for a match he had exhausted the solid facts. Don then took over and described the underground passage he had seen that afternoon. He was about to go further, when the old man held up a hand. The facts only, if you please. Mr. Court, what you saw in the underground chamber fits in remarkably with something I stumbled on this afternoon while I was skating. Skating, Clark said. Ice skating at North Lake. It's completely frozen over, and I'm not so decrepit that I can't glide on a pair of blades. Well, I was gliding along, humming the skater's waltz, when I tripped over a stump. When I said... I stumbled on something. I was speaking literally because I fell flat. While I lay there with the breath knocked out of me, my face was only an inch from the ice, and I realized I was eye to eye with a thing, just as you were, Mr. Court. You mean there was something under the ice? Exactly, staring up at me. Balefully, I suppose you could say, as if it resented my presence. Did you see the whole face? I'd be embroidering if I said yes. It seemed, but I must stick to the facts. I saw only the eyes, two perfectly circular eyes which glared at me for a moment, then disappeared. It could have been a fish, Clark said. No, a fish is about the most expressionless thing there is, while these eyes had intelligence behind them. None of your empty fish stares. Clark knocked his pipe against the edge of the bar so the ashes fell in the vicinity of an old brass cuspidor. So, since what you and Don saw were both under the surface, we could put two and two together and assume that some kind of alien beings have taken up residence in Superior's lower levels? Only if you think two and two make five, Doc Bendy said. But even if they don't, there's a great deal more going on than Civic knows or the Garrett Ruback crowded Cavalier will admit. It seems to me, gentlemen, that it's time I set up a committee. End of chapter six. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com.